discussion on global trends in UGC moderation. I would like to welcome our moderator for the session, Mr. Kazim Rizvi, founding director, The Dialogue. And now welcoming our panelists, we have with us today, Dr. Pavan Dugal, founder and chairman, International Commission Cybersecurity Law, Mr. Stephen Collins, senior director, Public Policy International, SNAP Inc., Mr. Bimal Reba, co-founder, Trev, and Mr. Anirudh Rasogi, founder, Ikigai Law. I would request all the panelists, I would request all the delegates to kindly keep posting their questions in the chat box and we will select a few and the moderate mod and give it to the moderator towards the end of the session. Over to you, Mr. Nizvi. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, you are. Great. Thank you so much, IMAI, for uh, organizing this session and for uh, inviting me to uh, moderate this discussion. Uh, in fact, when I saw the topic, uh, discussion on global trends in these QGC moderation, which is user generated content moderation. Uh, I quickly sort of said yes, because probably this is the hottest topic in discussion right now in India with the new IT rules coming in force. And a lot has been discussed in India in terms of how we should look at content moderation going forward. So, definitely, in terms of the timing, it's really topical and timely. And thank you to all our panelists for uh, joining. And I think we have a great one hour of discussions around what's happening in the world. Uh, just to sort of share every uh, sort of a few uh, pointers. One, we'll, we'll invite all our speakers to sort of uh, lay the lay the, the pointers for five minutes each. So the first 20 to 25 minutes will be focused on the opening also sort of the early remarks. And um, basis their remarks, we will then have a Q&A session. And we also invite you all the audience and who, those who are watching us across the globe to please uh, share questions in the chat box and also engage with us and we will be happy to answer those uh, through our speakers. Um, I think we have a great lineup of experts today who will be talking about global trends in the UGC in the UGC ecosystem. Um, and we're looking at technology, we're looking at the role of intermediaries becoming as safe spaces or should be the safe spaces of speech. Uh, but at the same time, we're also seeing that internet has been abused, it's being used for various crimes and various uh, issues such as fake news, misinformation, disinformation, CSAM being spreading on the internet. So the law enforcement uh, has been sort of globally looking at this issue and trying to uh, bring in certain regulations and laws to curtail the spread of CSAM fake news, while on the same hand, there are also issues with respect to how free and how open are these intermediaries and the platforms and internet per se for the average user. So there is there is a, a sort of uh, a sort of a debate going on between uh, national security on one hand and securing the web, while on the same time ensuring that users have the right to free speech. Uh, while in my opinion, I think both security and free speech go together and should complement uh, each other. Um, and we are looking at various jurisdictions such as India, which came out with the new amended IT rules, which talk about proactively monitoring uh, or, or voluntarily doing it uh, for CSAM content on intermediaries. Then we're looking at takedown uh, in terms of how quickly the content should be taken down. Obviously, the share single judgment is uh, uh, the, the judgment which really sort of talks about how uh, content should be moderated and what should be the approach uh, when the Supreme Court passed that judgment 2015. And a lot has changed and evolved over a period of few years. And in the US, similarly, we are seeing debates where to catch a NAP CSAM content proliferators, the state is going after certain uh, provision and regulation in, in, in the uh, US uh, laws. And we're looking at section 230, uh, CDA uh, also being talked about whether there is a need to reform 230 or not. Uh, so whether there is a need to reform safe harbor provisions or not. Um, and safe harbor is something which provides immunity to platforms for third party content, which allows uh, users to enjoy the freedoms they have on the internet. Uh, but to what extent uh, is the debate uh, today? And we have a great lineup of speakers who will be sort of uh, alluding to some of these points as we take forward. So I'd like to introduce all of us and I'd like to welcome our speakers. And I'd like to start with Stephen first, and then I'll go to Anirudh 
uh, later, and then Bimal and Mr. Dug Dr. Dukkal as well, in terms of uh, global trends and what are they looking at and what are the debates they are uh, fighting and uh, the issues they are looking at in their jurisdiction. Dr. Stephen Collins is Senior Director, Public Policy International, SNAP, and uh, he has worked very closely with various uh, companies in the past and has a lot of expertise in this sector. So, uh, Dr. Collins, come, I'll come to you. Uh, what are your sort of opening remarks when you look at UGC moderation and what are the challenges with respect to A, streamlining content and making internet safe for all, but on the same hand, ensuring that uh, we, we sort of don't make internet a, a, a closed box. So, over to you. Thank you, Kazim, and uh, thanks very much to IAMA I for uh, inviting me onto this esteemed panel today and hello to all the other panelists. Um, it's such a gigantic topic to try to try to cover in five minutes. Maybe I'll just limit my um, focus of attention to um, the importance, I think, of um, the design stage of um, product design and building in kind of safety uh, features from from the start. The reason I say that is that if you look at the kind of the global legislative and regulatory trends currently in, uh, regarding intermediary liability, content moderation, and, and, and these kinds of these kinds of things, we see an awful lot of activity in um, in addition in addition to India, in the UK. You already mentioned CDA two hundred and thirty in the US. The UK is looking at the online harms bill. Australia, the online safety act. The EU with the digital services act, which is going to take over from the existing e-commerce directive, um, Chile, one of the first to introduce intermediary liability rules back in 2000, 2001, um, they are looking to, to review the, their rules as well. So what all of these rules have in common is that they're remedial. They seek to fix something when it's gone wrong. I think it, it would be helpful in parallel. Of course, we need these rules. There's no doubt about that. But I, I think in in parallel, it's worth um, looking uh, in more depth at what can be done to manage risk upstream in product design and development. And so when we think about concepts like safety by design, privacy by design, data minimization, those kind of design concepts, if they should be encouraged to be built in from the start. The best example of this, I would say, or a couple of examples. In Australia, the eSafety Commissioner's Office has produced binding safety by design principles, which all companies, this is a horizontal set of design rules, all companies should, should build into their products from the outset. And there's maybe a dozen kind of design principles that have to be adhered to. This minimizes risk upfront and takes away the need for heavy moderation and remedial um, work downstream. Similarly, with uh, privacy by design, um, as released by the uh, the Canadian Privacy Commissioner, I mean, many years ago, more than a decade ago, again, these are these are privacy related design principles, which create safer products, okay, obviously privacy, privacy focused in this case. Um, and again, what you have in terms of a, a product is a safer product before it's even being used. And so I'd like to see um, governments and regulators put a bit more emphasis on that and, and focus a bit more um, on the upstream element. The second piece I would say then more specifically and sort of Snap and Snapchat related. So Snap is the company that provides um, the Snapchat application. Um, not really a social media application, more of a private messaging app, but nevertheless, some of, some of the rules cover us, of course. And uh, what we do really is ensure that all the public content on Snapchat is either um, curated uh, by professional publishing partners or is pre-moderated by Snapchat prior to upload. Now, that's a huge task, I have to say, but when you see the very low levels of, say, fake news or hate speech, uh, misogyny, all types of harms um, that are very low, very, very low level on the platform, it's working for us. I don't suggest that's the solution to every platform. We're not trying to be a town square like social media companies, so it's slightly different. But um, it is it is a solution. We've invested heavily in um, pre-moderation capabilities. And also, of course, the, the majority of our public content comes from professional partners. So um, news publishers, for example, 
entertainment sports kind of um, publishers. And of course, they they have their own journalistic codes they need to abide by, and they they curate the content before it's uploaded. So um, I think that's also an alternative. So just to summarise there, and I, then I'll stop. Is on the one hand, let's think about upstream solutions so that we don't need to run around downstream looking at, at remedies. And secondly, let's try to think about companies taking on a bit more of a duty of care or a duty of responsibility. Um, which is foreseen in the intermediary liability guidelines in India, of course, just released, um, and um, see if there's more that they can do in that regard uh, in terms of keeping the platform safe. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Collins. I have a I have a follow up question to you uh, in terms of what you mentioned, and uh, I think this really sort of boils down to what I've been and we've been looking at globally, various countries. And we are seeing that over the last two years, including India, that the state is trying to regulate the internet more than it used to before um, and one of and the key reason being cited and is spoken of is the need to catch anti uh, anti state elements or uh, proliferators of harmful content which is sort of harming the society at large now on one hand there is a lot of justification and reason behind why the law enforcement agencies or the state needs to do that because we are also seeing that internet is brought sort of becoming more and more sort of a space for a lot of these elements to proliferate proliferate on on the on the ecosystem but on the other hand we're also seeing overbroad regulations which are sort of uh you know really uh, if you're looking at a needle in a haystack sort of a situation you you, you won't just look at the entire haystack you have to catch targeted uh, elements, but what you're doing is creating regulations which make the entire ecosystem uh, vulnerable to attacks, to uh, privacy violations, and to also sort of curb their rights. So, where do you sort of see this uh, debate and this sort of conflict taking shape? And uh, there is a need on both sides to come together and have an agreement. But how how do you think this could be resolved? Uh, because we do want the internet to sort of be free, but also we need to catch the anti-state elements as well. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kazim. It, it's an extraordinarily difficult question. And I think what we're seeing play out at the moment and will do probably for the next maybe three to five years is some countries not going far enough, some going too far, some having to row back, some having to put more rules in place until a, a, an, an adequate balance is found. It's super important to to find some kind of balance. I think on the on the regulatory side, um, what would be helpful is to is to avoid as much as possible prescriptive rules and try to try to adopt principles based regulation, which focuses on the what needs to be achieved and and leave it to the platforms and the intermediaries to work out how to achieve those policy end goals. The, the problem at the moment is this, I mean, with the kind of prescriptive regulation that we're seeing increasingly internationally is that the business models of the companies that are affected are really diverse, as you all well know, and as the audience here well knows, we're all doing slightly different things, um, providing content or, or services to different audiences um, or different, different users. And to have one set of tight, straight jacketed rules that, that prescribe exactly how you must behave in order to comply makes it extremely difficult and I think endangers kind of part of the vitality and diversity of, of um, internet services. And so what I would, I think what I would I'd like to see is um, a focus on developing horizontal uh, as, as far as possible. So a single set of horizontal principles based rules which tell us what needs to be done and leave it to the individual companies to decide how. Of course, that requires an oversight mechanism. That's why we have regulatory authorities. They would then provide the oversight. To me, that's that's the only way of achieving that balance that, that we all desire, Kazim. Um, at the same time as well, it creates um, an agility and a flexibility in the system, which allows the regulators to tweak, for, exa for example, at times of national crisis, of course, maybe the government will be more heavy handed at times of national crisis. You know, maybe there's there's a war or maybe there's, you know, topically a pandemic. 
maybe they need to be more heavy hand maybe they need to adjust adjust things in the short term that's okay but it's not okay if everything's prescribed because once you lose freedoms it's very very hard to get them back um, with a principles based um, approach you can indeed get them back so that that would be my my suggestion for um, regulators when con and governments of course government departments when contemplating um, how to resolve the dilemma thank you dr collins thanks a lot we'll come back to you uh, but I'll go to Anirudh, uh, and Anirudh is a lawyer who's, who leads the law firm called Ikigai Law, and Anirudh, of course, you've been following this debate in India, we've been sort of talking about it as well, you've, and your colleagues have also been speaking at various forums uh, across the country on the national So, I think uh, you don't need any introduction on what's happening in India, but would love to sort of get an early overview on what you think, and then we'll take it from there. Sure, Gazan, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I think while these uh, debates are, uh, you know, interestingly, this topic is being debated across the world um, real time. Uh, I, I think uh, it would be interesting to see, to look at the, the recent guidelines in India. And I would just want to spot certain key issues, which I believe are reflective somewhat uh, or are going to trigger uh, debates, uh, you know, probably across the world as well. Um, and, I, and I think um, there, there are four points that I want to really talk about. One, um, uh, you know, the, the intermediary guidelines talk about personal liability for compliance officers, right? Now, um, just a little bit of background, even in the prior uh, rules that were, that were introduced in draft form in India, um, in fact, had something which proposed that every uh, that, that intermediaries, global intermediaries, need to have uh, need to be locally incorporated in India. So the the principle that you know the government wants to catch somebody's neck here, right? That uh, a global company should not be able to avoid compliance because they are uh, they don't have a physical presence in India is not something that the that the government is comfortable with, right? Now, of course, while that uh, requirement was uh, was dropped. Uh, what the government has now introduced is, uh, you know, your for for uh, your uh, significant social media intermediaries, is that compliance officers to have to be residing in India and to have personal liability. And I'm not sure which uh, which requirement, the earlier one or this, is more problematic because um, honestly, I mean, um, if nothing else, this is going to be a really highly paid job. Uh, you uh, is essentially intend to place personal liability, and what I'm not sure of is if that person is then going to be liable also for third party content so uh, right so it is not only liability under the intermediary guidelines but liability for so the the uh, the uh, the uh, possibility that you will then be a party to any you know third party lawsuit that's going on uh, in the country which i think is uh, which which i think is fairly problematic but um, I, I i do believe that we might have somewhat you know india might have set off a, a larger kind of uh, um, uh, you know, we are in a way setting a precedent for uh, uh, for the rest of the world as well. So that's one. The second is the liability of platforms to regress grievances. Right now, uh, this kind of goes beyond the Shreya Singhal uh, uh, standard, of course. That uh, you know, essentially, you are not only it's not that I mean, not only do you have to act on a court order or a government order, but in essentially any grievance. Um, within 15 days, need to be needs to be disposed of. And I wonder when you you know when you talk of disposal, then ultimately it does mean that you are taking you're sitting in decision over that over that complaint. So in in in, uh, in kind of uh, you know gets around uh, goes beyond the Shreya Singhal uh, threshold. A um, couple of concerns here. One is how do you how do you expect intermediaries to sit in evaluation over what is defamatory, for example, uh, what what is um, uh, you know what is obscene or not, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But then. Also, this is going to open a floodgate of complaints, I guess. And the the concern uh, from from an intermediary perspective is the sheer cost of uh, of you know managing these these uh, uh, you know these hundreds and thousands of uh, grievances that you're going to that you're going to receive and to to also redress them in an effective manner, um, right? So I, I I'm not sure if intermediaries are really the right fora for uh, uh, for addressing these these kind of uh, uh, you know grievances and so that's 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 one uh, that's one concern which is another debate number two that i think uh, this this uh, these rules set off the third is the use of automated tools now of course this is something which uh, which already is uh, you know is pretty much being debated across the world 
um, intermediaries, different different uh, platforms, uh, you know, resort to automated tools in different ways. Um, I, I think uh, in India, the use of automated tools has been introduced only for a select kind of content. They've introduced an, a best endeavor standard here, so it's, it's somewhat unclear whether whether is it uh, is it mandatory for you to introduce these tools, or you have to in, you have to apply best endeavors to uh, to do what you can. Uh, but I think there are certain good principles that have been adopted also, where, where um, you know the the measures need to be the, the measures adopted by platforms need to be proportionate to the interest of free speech and privacy. There needs to be appropriate human oversight and periodic review of tools. But with the qualifier that the review shall be had with regard to accuracy, fairness, propensity of bias in the tool itself. And I think uh, while there is there's generally, you know, it's kind of getting people worked up a little that um, what is the definitive standard that I as a platform need to really, really need to follow, right? I mean, what is best thing there was? I mean, how much is good enough or not, etc. But I think there is no way to essentially have a definitive standard either. This is, uh, you know, these technologies uh, are evolving as we speak. The problems are evolving and getting amplified as we speak, and I think um, uh, you know it, it requires certain fluidity as well. Uh, and maybe that is the reason why there is no mandatory obligation, but rather an endeavor, the best endeavor standard. Uh, possibly that's the thinking here. But clearly, there's going to be this big debate globally, continuing to be, uh, which will continue uh, to be had, which is the use of automated tools. To what extent do you have human intervention, and how do you balance the two, et cetera, et cetera. And the last, I think, is a, is a small point I want to make about an intro interesting introduction of the Good Samaritan clause um, in these in these rules, right? Which is Essentially, that if a platform is voluntarily taking down content, then uh, you will, you do not lose your safe harbor for that reason. I think that's a that's an interesting uh, in insertion because uh, I think one of the one of the key pushbacks to the prior prior rules was that well, if I'm going to I as a platform, I'm going to exercise editorial control. Um, uh, you know, then then uh, how do I how do I call myself continue to call myself and benefit? Uh, from the intermediary safe harbor, harbor principles. So I think this is an interesting uh, uh, insertion, but the, the only larger challenge I think is that, uh, uh, you know, are platforms more likely now to take down content? They are going to be more, they're going to be incentivized to take down content because one, the cost of grievance redressal, the problem of effectively regressing grievances in a 15 day period where you are meant to evaluate subject, uh, you know, areas uh, or evaluate on, on issues which are primarily not meant to be, you're, you're not really a court of law. And third, with the with the personal liability for individuals, and fourth, with the Good Samaritan protection, I think all of this put together, um, I, I wonder if intermediaries or platforms are really likely going to be incentivized to take down content uh, more liberally. So that's that. these are the four um, issues I, I, I identify from our rules, which I believe are representative of larger debate we had locally. So, uh, Anirudh, I have a couple of questions and uh, I'll, I'll sort of play the devil's advocate for the first part. Uh, what's wrong with greater liability? Because, you know, the intermediaries are big and they have a lot of technology. They have a lot of uh, revenues as well. They have a lot of stake in the country. So what's wrong if, if the government is actually trying to push for more regulation? And uh, you yourself mentioned that the proactive monitoring is actually a good endeavor. So it's not a very hard coded rule yeah. anyway. Sure, sure. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think uh, what I want to really stick to here is the core principle, uh, which is this, that ultimately uh, intermediaries, digital intermediaries perform an important role in today's society and economy, right? Uh, recognizing which your, uh, you know, your, ex your prior kind of intermediary guidelines, for example, uh, I mean, that recognizing which you you essentially create the safe harbor for digital intermediaries, right? Like they are performing a, they are performing an important role. Uh, there are risks, yes, but you need to balance out and you need to pr provide a safe space. Now, I think we need to we need to stick to that principle. So yes, uh, we need to there, there are there are emerging challenges which need to be addressed, and they may be addressed better with I mean one of the ways to address it is by by ensuring that there is liability and, and somebody is held accountable, correct? Uh, but, the, but the way you bring about these rules and implement them should not come at, in the way of the larger, the core principle, which is that these intermediaries perform an important role. So if you start, if, if it becomes a free speech issue, if it starts meaning that, well, intermediaries are going to be more liberal, and in fact, they have a clear incentive to take down content, 
uh, without really putting themselves at stake. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, because until now you've seen enough situations where intermediaries would actually even hold up to governments and say in certain cases, well, like, no, I'm, I'm sorry, this is something that we cannot, cannot, uh, cannot take down. Uh, I, I think that 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 somewhat changes with these new new rules is is, is my logic. Right. So no, right. I, 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 in fact, my second question is on this only. Do you feel that? over broad regulation and it's split into two parts so we'll make it quick uh over broad regulations could lead to most self-censorship by the intermediaries. that's one and also the fact that are we creating an ecosystem where if we are sort of putting more onus on the intermediaries to sort of uh, take down content uh let's let's say if we are moving away from a reactive approach which was enshrined in a single case to a more proactive approach coded in law, but does that mean that the intermediaries become arbiter of truth? So, just wanted to sort of get your sense on that. No, no absolutely, Kevin. I think I'll, I'll just I'll just say that. Well, uh, so yes, all the the four points that I I, I listed out, I think together clearly cl clearly lay. A clear, if I were an intermediary, more so if I were a compliance officer, I would definitely tend to kind of you know uh, err on the side of caution here. Uh, given just what what is at stake personally and for the organization, um, uh, so so that's that's one thing. And the second, yes, I, I think uh, uh, very much. I, the 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 problem is that you are essentially asking the intermediary to become to 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 become the arbiter of truth. I, I think that 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 really is the challenge. I'm not sure if the platform, uh, if a if a digital platform should be playing that part at all. Right. Thanks, Anirudh. We'll, we'll come back to you later. But I'll go to Bimal uh, here, who's been patiently listening. And he's a co-founder with Trell that seeks to build India's largest lifestyle-focused community platform with a mission to empower every Indian to make a better lifestyle choice. So, uh, Bimal, pleasure to talk to you. I think we haven't spoken in the past, but good to have you here. Um, so, yes, Anirudh and Stephen have been sort of talking from a regulatory perspective, but I want to know from you from a business point of view, from uh, actually being one of those intermediaries, if I may per se, or, 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 a, uh, or a platform which has UGC content, uh, do you feel that with these regulations coming in, uh, is it going to impact your business propositions in the country? Will it make it more difficult for you as a, say, a startup to operate? Uh, so sort of just wanted to get your sense on that and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, thanks, Kasim. It's a, it's a good question. Um, being uh, I'm playing a role of intermediary here, right? So I think I've been um, also listening to Anirudh's viewpoint on intermediaries. But uh, even before I start with what I think about this process, let's let's all agree to the fact, uh, you know, the social media platforms at the end of the day are media platforms. They do pass on creator liabilities when it is required, and they do self-regulation and censorship, right? Irrespective of a government's interference or not, non-interference, the intermediaries are doing this job. Right. Uh, sometimes it might be a bit delayed uh, because at the rate of the content or uh, being generated on the platform or promoted or propagated, sometimes it's not even the control of a social media platform at the end of the day. But the intermediary is uh, intermediaries are in fact playing this role on a day to day basis, and there is no doubt about it. Right. Second, let's talk about regulations. Right. Uh, to, there are regulations in place today. I mean, we're not talking about about even FTC or a, you know CMA. Right. So what we're talking about even in India. We talk about uh, ASCI coming with uh, its own regulate regulations for influencer marketing in India. But again, it's all self-regulatory. It's recommendations from their side in terms of how we should show branded content. Uh, how, how what is the responsibility of a media owner? What is the responsibility of an influencer? And what is the responsibility of a brand when they engage with each other to promote certain content on the platform? But again, it's self-regulatory in nature. So it's not like the intermediaries are not doing the job and responsibilities, and it's not like there are regulations in place, uh, right? Uh, but the challenge right now is uh, it's it's about uh, the problem statements that we're dealing with today are only amplifying in nature because before it was just a one to many broadcasting platforms, right? And it was scheduled programming. You would know well in hand what to control, what not to. But today you're on a many to many platform, right? There are so many nodal points. How would you control them, right? So the challenges will exist forever. Uh, uh, in fact, the number of platforms, the modes of communications between each other, they're going to increase, right? Two years down the lane, if if we just if you have a time machine today, right? We we sit in that and go to 2023. You, you would realize the number of social media platforms or or the current social media platforms at that point of time would be completely different. 
and the modes of enga engagement would be more encrypted in nature or or could have a more higher potential of you know set, sending in fake content or fake news than what it is today but uh, at the same time uh, you know what i also believe and truly trust is the intermediaries even uh, at that point of time will play the role of self -censor censorship even before the government would come in and they would do their role no that that's great to know so do you do you feel as somebody who operates uh, a startup here in, in india and anirudh spoke on compliance do you feel that this is going to make it more difficult for you to operate uh, in india number one number two do you also feel that investments would get impacted due to uh, over broad regulations no i don't think so uh, because it is not a uh, a rule applied to an individual organization it's a rule applied to the entire industry right so uh, what does that mean is the business model would remain the same obviously at all points but the the way uh, it, it would be carried out would be different in in all means and mediums the way the content has to be moderated before it goes up online to users might change right uh, the number of steps for uh, the content to be pre moderated might be more at the end of the day or or uh, the definition of an influencer or a content creator of the platform could change right uh, these these mechanics would change but i don't think it will uh, lead to a major business impact at the end of the day it's been happening i mean it's just not about social media right it's just a take take about or uh, talk about media in general it's happening with media too right uh, over the time that that's how media has always evolved right with in, under the scope and scrutiny of regulations uh, either understanding its traffic understand moderating its content so the same would be applicable for social media too i don't think it's a challenge interesting thanks a lot bimal i think that's a good practitioner perspective we'll we'll come back to you but we'd like to go to dr dugal now uh, and uh, Dr. Dugal, I think if you can uh, unmute yourself and maybe uh, switch on your screen um, so that we know that you're listening to us. Are, are you there, Dr. Dugal? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, so Dr. Dugal, I think you've heard all our panelists and uh, Anirudh and Stephen has spoken very clearly on the impact of overbroad regulations. Bimal has given a very interesting perspective of a practitioner and, and sort of he opines that it won't really change a lot in terms of the business operations, etc. Uh, for somebody who's who's been practicing this in the courts and is a leading lawyer and a leading legal voice on these issues, how do you see the evolving landscape of regulations from 2015 when the share single judgment was passed and when the supreme court was clear, very clearly saying that safe harbor is intrinsic to the internet and the fact that we need a reactive approach to take down of content and that for third party liability intermediaries should not be held liable because that will just sort of create a lot of chaos uh, but then over the last few years we've seen we've also done a lot of research on this that high courts uh, are interpreting it in a different manner and sometimes even the law enforcement agencies are interpreting it in a different manner uh, and that has led to the new rules which have now been notified so for somebody who's been reading the law practicing the law around these cyber issues what's your take on on the latest development uh, and how do we go from here well i think we have to see this holistically uh, with the coming of covid 19 we are now entering into a new uh, kind of an age it's a watershed event Already, uh, the COVID-19 is coming across with the new cyber world order. That's what I've written in my recent book as well, New Cyber World Order Post-COVID-19. So these changes have to be seen in that particular context. We also have to see it in the context of the Christchurch uh, Declaration. We have to see it in the context of uh, the executive order passed by President Trump, asking DOJ to reconsider 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And I think what's currently happened in India is more a kind of a knee-jerk reaction of the government after uh, WhatsApp failed to effectively address the concerns of the people. So the impression that Indian nation was getting in was that these service providers were big time intermediaries, big tech companies, and they, while they were targeting India, were not willing to comply with Indian law. So now I think the landscape has been completely changed effective 25th of February 2021. Number one, uh, these rules uh, have been constitutionally challenged in terms of their validity. But uh, we found out that no court has given a stay on uh, the operation of these rules. Number two, these rules have opened up a Pandora's box of criminal liability and criminal prosecution for uh, the top management 
of these intermediaries, which effectively means that, look, uh, there are going to be criminal prosecutions under the Information Technology Act and under the Indian Penal Code against these kinds of companies and their top management. Now, that completely changes the landscape, I believe. And I think that puts the intermediaries on a back foot. So I think uh, till such time, more evolution of jurisprudence takes place. It will be far more prudent if companies with comply with these kind of rules, good, bad, or worse. I personally believe that these rules are to the large extent uh, going beyond the scope of the Information Technology Act 2000. And therefore, uh, they may be slightly modified by the, by the courts in the coming times. But having said that, till such time, they remain, they are the law of the land, and they will have to be complied with. It also opens up a Pandora's box because effective 25th of February, the legal exposure is already opened. Uh, companies are now already under the exposure of criminal liability. That's one. So compliance will have to be of paramount necessity. Well, while the government will take its own sweet time to let us know the nuances of this, the fact still remains is that uh, to the extent possible, intermediaries must be seen to be compliant with these kind of uh, rules, but they are not the end of the game. They're only a transient phase that I'm currently seeing. I'm expecting more regulation to come in, uh, given the thought process within the government. Now, whether it comes in with, through the process of the IT Act, or whether it will be coming through by means of secondary legislation under the Personal Data Protection Bill, this is something that we'll have to wait and watch. But I think the days where we could actually take the benefit of the policy vacuum in India, and yet continue to do what we were supposed to be doing as intermediaries are now long gone. It's watered down the bridge. And right now we have to be tightened for a more uh, kind of documented compliances. Look, in India, uh, whatever you verbally say will be of not of any relevance. You will have to prove documentation to show that you've exercised due diligence. And mind you, while the IT rules 2021 have only uh, superseded the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines rules 20, uh, and 2011, they still have not overruled the issues pertaining specifically to other rules which are also coming into force in 2011. So I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, we'll have to be uh, open to far more exposure to legal liability. I would see a, a tsunami of now legal actions against intermediaries because India is a very litigious society. And anybody who does not feel uh, that his uh, you know, grievance has been appropriately addressed is likely to go into the criminal prosecution mode. This will be particularly relevant in those cases where uh, which pertain to the violation of uh, privacy and obscenity and stuff like that. For all other things, you still have that statutory benefit because the law has itself said you have to wait for a court order or for an order from a governmental agency, which is a very, very time consuming process. But having said that, I think we will have to just make sure that uh, documenting due diligence will be of crucial necessity. Compliance will have to be the only mantra for all these uh, big data companies and big tech companies as they go, go across. And mind you, 2021 is only the opening season of more compliances with personal data protection bill coming in, with now new geospatial policy coming in. I think the government has suddenly gone into an overdrive and uh, more and more companies must now be clued up as to what's emerging on the horizon and how quickly they can be seen to be on the right side of the law. Thank you, Dr. Dugal. I have a couple of questions, two or three questions I would like to ask you. One is, um, and we've seen that uh, with respect to the fact that India is one of the sort of leading countries when it comes to access to information from big tech companies in terms of for law enforcement purposes. I think India ranks number two or three when it comes to this. But we're also seeing that not many FIRs are actually lodged in, in prosecuting some of those anti-state elements uh, after having collected a lot of information from the intermediary. So what, what's your take on, is, is, is this a lack of enforcement problem or is it a regulatory problem? So that's one. Number two is, and I think you really mentioned that it's a knee-jerk reaction and obviously it will hit the big tech and big time big intermediaries as well. Now we're all for regulating the big tech, but are, are the laws somewhere sort of in their approach going to hurt the rights of an average common internet user? So that's number two. And number three is sort of um, looking at the evolution of jurisprudence. Do you feel that there is a more sort of a consultative requirement here to have a consultative discussion between various organizations, stakeholders, and then create soft laws like, let's say, the Manila principles or the Santa Clara principles, rather than hard code them into rules? So I uh, would love to hear from you. We, we can't hear you, Dr. Dugal. I think there's some disturbance. 
Can you hear me now, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, thank you for those questions. Uh, number one, it's an issue of enforcement. We, uh, despite having the law, are likely to see a straddling of uh, the the non-registration of FIR effect, where uh, more most of the cases we'll see the police not registering an FIR, and I expect more and more litigants to go to the criminal court for the criminal prosecution of these uh, intermediaries and uh, significant social media intermediaries. That is going to increase the surface of potential legal attack on these service providers. Number two, I think what's currently happening is something that's happened in too much of a great hurry. I don't think this entire uh, phenomenon has been correct of trying to regulate uh, the um, content, content uh, portion by means of the uh, root of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, primarily because the primary legislation never really envisaged that regard. So I expect more and more challenges uh, to come in this regard. So we'll have to create more capacity, but ultimately it will all have to do with more consultative process. You cannot, on a knee-jerk reaction, put a, a press a button and come back with something without conduct, uh, really consulting all major stakeholders who are going to be directly impacted. Yes, from a user's perspective, the IT rules 2021, I believe, are a distinctive step forward because they tend to enhance uh, the, the significance of the user rules, uh, their user rights and privileges. But from the perspective of these intermediaries, there's also a lot, lot of uh, focus on burden of compliances. Now, these have been caught unawares, primarily because no time frame has been given uh, as to uh, within which they must do that. The rules got notified on the night of 25th of February. And as of 25th February 2021, you had no options, you had no window period for compliance, you were supposed to comply. And if you're not complying, the clock of exposure to legal liability uh, started ticking on 25th. So I think this knee-jerk reaction has to be avoided. People should not be getting unpleasant surprises. It's a good idea that if we can have consultation with stakeholders which represent the interests of major, major uh, players, so if organizations like IMAI or other organizations are adequately priorly consulted in point of time, before coming up with this exercises, at least we can we can prevent a scenario where uh, we are coming up with uh, unworkable laws. We are coming up with laws that are ultimately going to uh, hinder the growth of uh, business and which ultimately may actually land up doing far more harm than good. Somewhere down the line, the government will have to come up with a harmonious golden balance to ensure that, look, uh, while the interests of the sovereign nation are important and must be appropriately addressed, at the other hand, uh, the interests, as also the business uh, interests of stakeholders and the rights of uh, the users must be appropriately balanced in a harmonious manner so that there is no prejudicial in impact caused to the operation of uh, the various activities of various stakeholders. Thank you, Dr. Dugal. Uh, thank you so much. I think that's very really interesting to hear. I, I think we have 15, 20 minutes uh, to have a quick Q&A and a sort of rally with all the speakers. But Anirudh, I'll come to you and then I'll go to Dr. Collins. Uh, I think there is a unanimous con sort of consensus amongst all the speakers that obviously the regulations are a little overbroad and could do more harm than good. But again, I like to play the devil's advocate and sort of ask the fact that what can the state do? Right. And there are a lot of real issues, real life harms on the Internet, like you, you, due to the Internet, you have real life problems facing every day. What can be done to solve those issues? Uh, I think Dr. Collins spoke of the balance, but how do we really achieve that balance in India? So and then I could go to Dr. Collins after you. So, yeah. Yeah, no, Kazim, I mean, uh, that's a that's a difficult and but a fair question. Um, um, I, I think. Uh, Personally, one thing that comes to my mind is that uh, we, we need to look at different categories of content differently. So there are um, uh, the, 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 the danger is that when we essentially bucket all kinds of content as, as one category and implement the same kind of uh, rules and liabilities with respect to that larger bucket, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. But uh, so, for example, uh, I mean, content that uh, that, uh, you know, so I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the list of your know, content in the in the uh the, the the recent rules right so if something is harmful to children for example obscenity pornographic uh, pedophilic um uh, i i think one can one can try and keep that content in a slightly more stringent 
bucket, right? But uh, um, uh, worry is how loosely sometimes uh, content that is deemed to be like, like we have this new insertion of uh, content, which is patently false and untrue with the intent to mislead or harass a person, right? Now this could really be uh, anything. And I, I, I guess it's going to just open a floodgate of, um, of, of uh, grievances or complaints, uh, right? Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, defamation again, I mean, or, or even uh, something which otherwise, uh, you know, looks like a high threshold that is um, content threatening the unity, integrity, defense, security, and sovereignty of India. But we have seen enough number of uh, examples uh, in the recent past, when this when this is used, you know, uh, uh, a little too liberally, right? So, so I think uh, we need to we need to create different buckets of content. We need to define what content is uh, is uh, uh, is concerning a little better, a little more narrowly, uh, and I think then implement different, uh, 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 you know, different different uh, thresholds, different liability uh, frameworks to target a different kinds of content. That's that's one thing that comes to my mind. Right. No, I, it's interesting you mentioned this because I think uh, a lot of the research which is also happening is uh, the fact that uh, the state has a right to do surveillance, but the more targeted you are, the more effective you can be. So I think it's also important to understand that are these rules going to hamper the security of the country which for which the rules are actually made? I think that's something which we also are looking at. And sometimes it does appear that overbroad regulation could lead to national security problems. But Dr. Collins, I'd like to come to you. And you've been sort of looking at the EU perspective. Obviously, UK has come up with uh, the harms laws. And uh, I, I think there are some countries which have been talking about regulation. Um, in the US, there's a lot of debate now with the Biden administration talking about reforming Section 230 CDA. Uh, and there is a lot of talk in town happening in terms of what should be done. I think the FOSTA SESTA and there are a, a couple of other laws which are uh, sort of already sort of looking at this issue. And then you have the Earnit Act, right? And the Earnit Act also sort of trying to do that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, with India passing the rules, with Australia doing what it's doing, uh, there is a sort of global consensus that look, there is uh, the state is trying to catch up uh, to the to the intermediaries. But on the other hand, in 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 the wake of catching up, are we creating more problems than solutions? So that's another one of those difficult but fair questions. I think. <laughs> um, listen, the uh, I think it's clear now to everybody that um, there is. Are, I think uh, it's not legal than a, perhaps a moral requirement on um, certain intermediaries of a certain scale, size and influence to have a duty of care or a duty of responsibility in some form to their users. Um, one of one of the speakers before, I can't remember who spoke about the Good Samaritan clause and whether that was a concept that could be further developed because I, I think that's right you know without some such clause in the past we've as intermediaries we've been hindered from doing more than we would want to do for fear of increasing our liability even though we were acting in good faith so uh, countries like the uk like the eu are integrating some form of duty of care or duty of responsibility or good samaritan clause into draft legislation and uh, and regulation i think that will really help a lot um then the, the question then arises well what does that really look like what, what does it really mean it's fine to say a duty of care but it's kind of fluffy and, and airy and doesn't doesn't really mean anything i think the first piece which has also been recognized in the um indian intermediary liability guidelines is the um um need for intermediaries to adopt um proactive approaches to the most egregious content um, out there that's uh, you know circulating on, on the public internet. We think here most immediately of child sexual abuse material, but we could also think about terrorist material, for example. And you see the largest companies have come together through various coalitions to develop um, technological solutions like photo DNA. Um, which is a software program using a hash database of CSAM images, which um, actually all the major companies contribute to and um, uh, imp have implemented. That's working in the background on an automated basis the whole time. The number of uh, kind of false positives is, is increasingly low. All those uh, images 
uh, found are sent to NECMEC, the organization in, in the United States that deals with, with this material, and then subsequently onto law enforcement internationally. Not all companies have implemented photo DNA in their services. Perhaps they should. Perhaps that's something they should consider. Uh, equally, um, there's a similar video hash database originally developed by Google and YouTube. Um, companies increasingly, including Snap, um, are implementing that on the on the CSAM video side of things. And so we can imagine more of those kind of solutions, I think, as 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 time goes on. Secondly, the other thing I think that is important that companies reflect on and then act on is pretty much all the companies have community guidelines in some form. Snap has very rigorous um, and strict community guidelines, which we strictly enforce. Um, I would say that most companies probably don't strictly enforce their, their own community guidelines. If you read, you go onto any large platform, they will have community guidelines about how they expect their users to behave. But how do they enforce those? Really, it's generally reactively. There are very few companies, Snap is one of the exceptions, I think, that um, proactively moderate um, public content. And I think that's part of our duty of care, our duty of responsibility. And I would like to see that kind of activity spread further um, across the industry. And I would like to see then in, in regulation, some kind of Good Samaritan protection, acknowledging that that kind of duty of care that we've uh, provided. It's interesting you spoke of uh, the community guidelines and duty of care and also um, the fact that C 230 CDA was actually formed on the pretext of uh, Good Samaritan, that platforms would take down content in good faith and operate in good faith. So I think definitely more trust has to be built between the intermediaries and government. And I'll come to Dr. Dubbel on what can be done to build that trust because I think there is a lot of trust deficit right now, and especially in India with respect to the internet companies and the government, but both have to work together for, for the people, for different stakeholders. So what's your uh, uh, sort of tonic for that, uh, Dr. Dougal, in terms of how can trust be built even between users and companies, right? So I think that's very important. So your take on that, and then I'll go to Bimal. I think for building trust, it's very important that you have to be transparent. You have to have a, a kind of an uh, inclination or an offer to be uh, accountable. And you have to focus on capacity building and creating more awareness. Because uh, from the governmental perspective, the government is only seeing things from a standpoint of a sovereign government, whose only job is to go ahead and protect the sovereign interests. Maybe it's time that they should be uh, actually sensitized about the nuanced approach that needs to be adopted. You cannot have uh, the same approach that's going to be treating apples and oranges together. Similarly, users have to be sensitized as to how the companies can and are indeed trying in order to go ahead and address their grievances. A majority of the users take a random of uh, 10 internet uh, social media users in India and ask them uh, how many of them feel that the companies have been reactive to their grievances. The chances are the seven or eight out of them are going to say that the companies were completely unreactive to their uh, kind of grievances. Merely having a grievance officer would not suffice. Merely putting a name of an Indian who's located in the US as your grievance officer is a bad strategy because it seems to alienate uh, the users into believing that there is a company who wants to milk the Indian market but does not really want to provide effective remedy. So it's all about more capacity building. It's all about giving that impression that, look, these big tech companies, these social media companies are not a law into themselves. They are here as part of a bigger strategy to really go ahead and, uh, uh, shall I say, develop the Indian market and also enable the users to reach out to their best potential. So I think it's a cumulation of all strategies that will have to be done. Clearly, everybody will have to be taken on board. Otherwise, these kinds of knee-jerk reactions are going to come in. They're going to lead for more litigation. It's going to put in more compliance costs, time, money, and energy for the companies. In fact, it'd be far more better if now, henceforth, uh, the service providers could specifically start interacting on a more proactive basis, both with the government and also with the users to tell them, look, sir, you told us to do one, two, three. Apart from doing one, two, three, we're also doing five, six, seven. So here's what we are doing. So please don't come into this space. Allow us more self-regulation. Because the more we are able to convince the government 
that look, we are here to protect the Indian users and their interests, and we are not providing lip service, the lesser the chances that the government is to come is going to come back with these kind of uh, measures. But should we give an impression that, look, we don't care about laws in India, and that, look, we are a law into themselves, then be prepared. The government of India, like other governments across the world, are likely to come up with much more stronger legislations, uh, stronger regulations. That's not only going to increase and enhance the burden of compliance for these service providers, but more significantly, ultimately, land up in uh, very undesirable consequences, both from the user's perspective and also from the perspective of the big data companies. Thanks. No, absolutely, uh, Dr. Dogel, I completely agree with you. I think there needs to be a lot more communication between the intermediaries and the government, uh, maybe privately or publicly through whatever forums, you know, but I think there is definitely a lot more the need for communication and to sort of come out and talk about what they're doing, what they can do and what they can't do. I think that will really help develop trust and also on the government's part to actually trust them more in terms of, okay, they're coming out with what they believe they can do best. I think that's that basic level of trust is critical uh, because the way internet is evolving and the way, you know, I think we're looking at a second wave of COVID now. So it appears that we will going to be staying at home through this year as well, like, 2021 might be a total washout. So we are dependent on the internet and the platforms more than we have been ever in, in our lives. So I think there has to be a sort of a way out in terms of building the, those trust, uh, finding the right mechanisms to work together. Bimal, I'd like to come to you before we go to uh, Q&A and I think a couple of questions on copyright we would like to take. So I'll, I'll request for an extension of five more minutes. But Bimal, uh, you heard the lawyers speak and uh, usually... Uh, lawyers tend to scare us. That's our job. Even I'm a lawyer. Uh, but uh, having heard the legal arguments, do you feel that as, as an intermediary in, in India, there is going to be some sort of, uh, uh, or do you feel any pressure? Or do you feel sort of okay, more compliance? And if I go wrong, you could be in line. So do you feel that sort of a fair pressure or, or more something which has to be done anyway? And you are complying with best you can. So, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think uh, I've heard all the viewpoints, and I'm absolutely in line in terms of having regulations or closely working with the government, right? But um, again, as I speak, the intermediaries are self-regulating themselves at all points of time, right? Some, but but the issue is sometimes it might get too late, right? Now that that's the worry that everyone has, right? We are not the messenger or not the message; we are just the media, right? So let's let's also talk about in terms of compliance issues, right? When when a government requests for certain data, they're actually going back to understand where the source of the data has actually originated from, right? Or or that fake information. That means you want the media to trace back to the or origin of the message from and uh, the first messenger who's created right. a such message, right? So what what I'm trying to say over here is, let's say today this me media trail as a media might not exist tomorrow but there could be some other media that might be existing, right? But the messenger and the message would still go to that platform, right? Irrespective of intermediaries being there today or tomorrow, the messengers and the message will actually take, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, at least advantage, uh, uh, you know, unlawful advantage of these platforms if they're giving them higher engagement. So this 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 issue, it's, uh, I think it's, it's just not about direct you know, even intermediaries regulating themselves, it's far higher than that, right? So what I, uh, myself personally, I look at it two forums, right? One is the platform themselves are self-regulating. That is good. That's a good Samaritan. We have our own principles. We make sure that every content is pre-moderated before it goes up there, right? And uh, we, we are open to work with government on day-on-day -day basis. But there is also, we need to understand where the liability actually goes, right? Uh, there is also a messenger who's trying to create this message. So there has to be also mechanisms in place to identify or has to, there has to be unique identifiers for this, uh, you know, content creators on this platform where we can actually trace back the origin of the content too, right? Now that, that is what you need to focus upon. It's just not about intermediaries, right? Because today I'm here as Bimal speaking out my mind in terms of what regulation means, but tomorrow uh, uh, in an online media, I could have seven bots of me created right now itself, which could have alpha, beta, and gamma names, and perpetuating a message that no one's uh, really comfortable about. And you would not know who it is. But would you blame this medium, uh, 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 Cisco WebEx, of not regulating it? No, you would not anticipate in terms of what that uh, messenger is 
about to do or intending to do. So Correct. there has to also be a certain regulation mechanisms in place to understand messengers or you didn't identify as around messengers. I'm not sure how that's going to pan out, but I think that that is a step in the right direction too. Uh, just not leaving uh, entire you know onus on 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 a media or or an intermediary and saying let's correct it. They are correcting, but sometimes it might get late. No, I agree. With you. In fact, that's something which is, could be a challenge. I think the whole tracing of origin of content. I think that's a, more of a technical issue. Uh, I think it's a very challenging issue in terms of. Are you undermining encryption or not? Uh, when, when sort of for let's say private messaging services, right? So I think that's something which does require a lot more consultation discussion because that's not just a legal problem; it's a more of a technical problem. Uh, that how do you really do that without undermining? Even, even it's it's not even yeah. It's it's also also comes to the privacy uh, policy of that particular platform. So it's not about even being tech, right? It's privacy policy, right? Today you talk or go and talk to Apple. And ask them about where this message has originated, or can can you help me unlock the phone? Yeah, now you've seen what what has happened for for, for just okay. unlocking one single iPhone in US, right? It's it's created news and ripples across across all the platforms. And uh, Apple is going to stick to its ground and talk about we being privacy first. And that's okay. you got to respect that at, at the end of the day. So if you are regulating, regulate. Uh, I mean, if you need to know understand messenger, who the messenger is, you need to have the laws and rules for messenger too. You cannot go back and ask the organization to redo its entire privacy policy. That will undermine its own own existence of business uh, as okay. a whole, right? So it's or not a technical yeah. architecture, or maybe the technical architecture also. I think that also could be a problem. But yeah. absolutely, I think that's fair. Uh, we have five to six more minutes. I'd like to quickly go to a couple of questions, uh, and uh, Anirudh and Dr. Tukkal and uh, Mr. Collins. I think we'll sort of come to you. So one is, uh, how can UGC and issue of fairness, to quality, privacy? Uh, and the availability of creative work and effort among legal issues, namely related to intellectual property rights, can such as copyright be addressed. So that's one. And the second is copyright laws play a factor in relation to user generated content as users may use such services to upload works, particularly videos that they do not have sufficient rights to distribute. So how can this be checked? So, uh, Dr. Dugal, maybe you would like to take uh, the question and then Anirudh. Can you just repeat the first part of the question? The voice was very unclear. Yeah. So, how can UGC and issues of fairness, equality, and privacy uh, and effort among legal issues, namely related to intellectual property rights such as copyright, be addressed? Well, I think there is no uh, clear uh, blacks and whites, there are a lot of gray zones. We'll have to be mindful of the overlaps that are existing. <clears throat> Clearly, we have to see it all in the context of uh, the Indian ecosystem, since we are all working here. We have to be mindful of the fact that the vacuums that are here are actually going to make life more difficult, primarily, because here the thought the leadership has to come from the government on how it can come up with a harmonious balance between ensuring protection of intellectual property rights on the one hand and fairness on the other hand. Similarly, while they have sought to give some kind of restrictions by saying, OK, uh, you have to wait on till such time you get a court order or an order from a governmental agency. Uh, what is primarily concerned is, is that only going to be for all issues pertaining to IPR? Because if it's uh, issues pertaining to uh, obscene content or privacy violated content, then the court order is not even required and is dispensed up with, which effectively means that for those categories of cases where which are dealing with off offensive content or obscene content, you are effectively making the intermediary as a judge who will then be required to judge the authenticity of veracity and will have to do it. Similarly, uh, on the first portion, which is rule three, they said no judge. You wait for a court order or an order from a government agency, to which extent they've gone, gone ahead on the lines of Shreya Singhal versus Union of India. But I think when it ultimately looks at more fairness, the fairness will have to be done both proactively and reactively. So we'll have to see that the service providers must be able to document that their conduct was fair, was transparent, and yet at the same time was not in violation. But it's like, you know, you are actually, uh, it's a very tight walk that you're walking on. You don't exactly know which one step you take exposes your company to which liability and which legal consequences. So I think it will require more guidance, <clears throat> more input from the government, and I think more uh, self-restraint. And if uh, the industry of organizations could start giving some voluntary kind of uh, sample practices 
which mm. the government can say look well, that's good enough for us we don't want to come in this space because you guys are doing good job i think that be a much better way uh, because it should be industry led by balance rather than a government led balance ultimately if we have to look at holistically but yes if it's issues pertaining to security then clearly the government will have the more upper hand thanks thank you dr dugal i think we are just about with time so i'll sort of go to each speaker and we'll go to dr collins first 30 seconds final remarks so over to you and i'll count the time yeah thanks kazim thanks to everybody else on on the panel um in 30 seconds very hard um i would say that um there's a, there's a legitimate a legitimate um series of interests here that are kind of colliding and having to coalesce and what we need i repeat what i said at the beginning uh in order to come to a um a mutually um beneficial conclusion for industry for government and most importantly for users and citizens is a a principles based regime that has sufficient flexibility to accommodate um different uh businesses different business models and also flex up and down at times of national or international crisis um it's not an easy solution and that's why i just talk about the umbrella principles um yeah i'll leave it there thank you thank you it's a pleasure uh, with dr collins to have you here it's a absolute pleasure to listen to you and uh, would love to be in touch with you uh anirudh 30 seconds what's your final take so sure, kazim uh, i think uh, as i said earlier we need to stick to the principle because of with you know the, the principle of why digital platforms have been given the safe harbor of protection in the first place right and i, I think any any regulation meant to govern um content on digital media needs to needs to strike the right balance in light of that principle that's that's uh, all i would like to say thanks anirudh pleasure to have you once again It's always always great to listen to you uh and sort of talk about internet laws and tech laws in the country uh bimal uh, over to you 30 seconds yeah i think uh, i'm in alignment with what the panel has talked about uh, uh, but also agreeing to the fact uh, that the platforms today are self regulating themselves uh, there is a environment of self regulation already existing in but the platforms should be open to work with the government if in case there are new regulations in terms of identity identification of message of the messenger uh, the platform should be open to it Thanks, Bimal. Lovely hearing from a practitioner from an intermediary who who operates uh, to sort of get first-hand views of these regulations. And Dr. Dugal, final to you. Uh, we've heard you again, but just sort of, what's your last key take in within thirty seconds? I think the key take is let's go back to the government. Let's tell them. Let's go for more self-regulation. You've given these rules. Good enough. Let us uh, let you know the various ways how the industry is going to come back with the ambiguous rules. And if possible, if you could start making these rules less taxing for the intermediaries, because if intermediaries thrive, the digital economy thrives, and if the digital economy thrives, India is going to thrive as a nation. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Dugal. And uh, with that, we have come to an end of the panel. Uh, we are eight minutes over the clock, which I don't know if it's good or bad. uh usually we are one minute behind uh over the clock so it's not that bad relatively uh and thank you to imai for organizing this session i think very topical very timely uh and love to sort of lovely remarks great insights from all the panelists i think three key takeaways for me as a moderator has been one we need more consultations so we need to build the trust between the government intermediaries and the users so everybody needs to work collaboratively Uh, and not in a conflict manner number 2 i feel that there is a need to have self regulation so regulation is required but self regulation targeted regulation narrow regulation rather than over broad rules and number 3 is obviously uh, looking at the future of the internet and why it's important to sort of have the safe harbor uh, as a foundation for the internet because that's really pushed digital economies to go and prosper globally and i think for india to become and realize the prime minister's dream of digital india safe harbor is going to play a very important role with that and with that i think i'll just try to conclude and thank all the panelists once again uh, for coming in taking their valuable time off with their uh, with their insights love to hear from all of you and uh, hope to see you all soon uh, in the next few weeks i think online it looks like because covid is surging so please stay safe stay home okay. and uh, like dr dugal is wearing a mask do wear mask at all times when you're outside so thank you so much thank you very
Thank, Thank you so much to all of our speakers for this insightful session and of course for being a part of Pixels 2021. Thank you so much everyone. Have a safe day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.